Hello, I'm Gordon Ritchie with Cole Morgan, and this is Two Minutes of Motion. In this segment, we'll look at the Resolver feedback device. The Resolver has been around for nearly as long as motion control itself, and is the go-to of many high vibration applications because of its robustness. But how it works and what's really going on inside a Resolver is a mystery to most people. A Resolver is made up of two basic components, the stator and the rotor. The stator has three transformers inside, the reference, which is the input, and the sine and cosine, which are the outputs. The rotor couples the reference signal back to the outputs located 90 degrees from each other and is the only part that actually moves. To understand how a resolver works, we're going to use our knowledge of how a transformer works. We know that if a wire is passed through a magnetic field, a current will be produced. Likewise, if a magnetic field is passed through a wire, a current is produced. If we input an alternating current, or AC current, into a transformer on the input known as the primary, as that field continually increases and decreases, going from plus to minus, the flux lines will be cutting through the windings of the output known as the secondary. Keep in mind that a transformer can have many outputs, all called secondaries and the output of one transformer can be connected to the input of another transformer. When the signal is transferred from the primary to the secondary, we say that that signal is coupled. If our transformer is cut in half so that the primary and secondary can move freely to each other, we will see that the output of the secondary will change relative to the position of the secondary to the primary. For our explanation, we're going to assume a one-to-one -one transformation ratio at 100% efficiency, which means the output is going to be at the same level as the input. So if we take our secondary and we begin rotating it, starting at zero degrees all the way back to 360 degrees, we'll see that our signal, as we begin rotating it, is going to drop, and at 90 degrees, we'll be at zero. As we continue rotating from 90 degrees to 180, we're going to see our signal come back, but we'll notice that it's out of phase. Again, when we rot rotate through to 270 degrees, we're going to be back to zero. And then from 270 degrees to 360, we're going to be back, and we will be at full amplitude and in phase. Inside the resolver, the same things are taking place, except we have two outputs, the sine and the cosine. We will use an oscilloscope to view what goes on inside a resolver. Channel A is connected to our reference signal, channel B is connected to our sine output, and channel C is connected to our cosine output. Start with the motor at zero position, or what is called the zero crossover point. Sine is at zero amplitude, and cosine is at peak amplitude and in phase. As we rotate from zero degrees to 90 degrees, we see that sine increases to peak amplitude, while cosine decreases to zero. Continuing to 180 degrees, sine increases to zero, while cosine, now out of phase, increases to peak amplitude. From 180 degrees to 270 degrees, sine, now out of phase, increases to its peak amplitude, while cosine decreases to zero. From 270 degrees to 360 degrees, which is also zero degrees, Sine goes to zero, while cosine, now back in phase, goes to its peak level. It is easy to see from this perspective that each point in a revolution is represented by a unique amplitude and phase relationship of sine and cosine, which makes the resolver an absolute feedback device. The analog signal is converted to a digital signal by the R to D converter, or resolver to digital converter, but that's another segment. For more information, check out the other Two Minutes of Motion videos or sign up for a class at www.colmorgan.com.